my name's Bruce Lawson. Today's talk is called How to Make Loveliness, because that is what the letters HTML actually stands for. It's going to be quick, so put on your seatbelt, grab a coffee or a beer or a soda, and let's go. So I'm Bruce, and I'm an HTML alcoholic. I believe that if we use and respect HTML, our sites will be lovelier. They'll be lovelier because they'll be more performant, so work faster. They will be more accessible to people with disabilities, many of whom use assistive technology. They'll be more robust, so they'll work better uh, if there's a bad network connection. You'll write less code, which means less code to test, and that means you get more time in the pub, which is every developer's human right. TLDR of this talk, use HTML properly. Write more HTML, write less JavaScript, and built-in beats bolt-on, bigly. I'm not against frameworks. When I was in Bucharest, Romania, I saw this graffiti saying, React, run, but I didn't panic. There's nothing wrong with React, it's just a tool. If you want to use React Mbengula Bonestrap Hub Pack.js for your next project, great, knock yourself out. Just make sure that it produces good HTML. Don't let the framework over engineer everything with JavaScript. Sir Uncle Timbo wrote, This is for everyone. And it was. Here is the first ever web page running in a modern browser. As you can see, it's completely responsive. As I narrow the viewport, the text just reflows. I can tab through the links and I can see where I am with the focus ring. And when I activate a link with the space bar or enter, I go to its destination. Totally accessible, totally responsive, out of the box. But we broke this inherent behavior of the web. We broke it by things like insisting upon fixed width sites, choosing bad contrast, uh, bad background colors, terrible illegible fonts, insisting upon pixel perfect layout, not captioning our videos or audio, breaking keyboard accessibility, taking away the focus ring indicator so people don't know where they are. And we did this because we didn't respect the raw materials of the web which are JavaScript, HTML, and CSS, symbolized here by Brendan Eich, who invented JavaScript, me, I didn't invent HTML, but I did invent the picture element, and Halcom William Lee, who co-invented CSS with Bert Boss. The great thing about the foundational technology, HTML, is that it's declarative. You just say, give me a button. You don't have to care how that button comes about. You don't have to wire up so that it's focusable from the keyboard or that it's activatable by the space bar or enter. You just declare it to be so, and it is. HTML's fault tolerant. In Internet Explorer, which never implemented the blink tag, you would still see the content of a tag that it doesn't understand. So you would see, OMG, you're having a seizure, not blinking. HTML is designed so that if the browser doesn't understand a tag, the content shows. And therefore, we can make HTML backwards compatible. With the video element, for example, a browser that understands the video element will play the video. A browser that doesn't understand it will show the content, can't play it, download it, and then they can look at the video on their default operating system media player. Nobody gets a substantially worse experience. And we can use this pattern to pave a cow path. So, for example, when we invented the picture element, we did it like this. A browser that doesn't understand picture will just show the content, which is that image. A browser that does understand picture and understands the WebP format will show the WebP, which is smaller file size for the same uh, picture quality. And a browser that doesn't understand the web page but does understand the picture element will show the JPEG. Nobody gets a worse experience. And that makes the web future-proof and backwards compatible. We saw the first ever web page in a modern browser. Here is my personal blog in the first ever web browser. Okay, it's got uh, 
a lovely 90s interface. And there's my website, okay? The Unicode doesn't show and there's no styling, but all the content is there. This is the superpower of the web. By contrast, JavaScript is not declarative. Uh, it's imperative. You have to tell JavaScript how to do anything. And this makes it a very powerful language, but you shouldn't use it if it's not necessary. Uh, Sir Uncle Timbo, when writing the design principles behind the web, wrote of the principle of the least power. The low power end of the scale is typically simpler to design, implement and use. Always use the least powerful tool to get the job done when developing for the web. Use the right tool for the right job. If you do everything in JavaScript, remember 30 million requests for JavaScript will time out every month, say BuzzFeed. As Phil Hawksworth wrote, that's a reminder if one were needed that we should design for resilience. Okay, you're saying nobody really turns JavaScript off, but they do. There are times when you have JavaScript off. Maybe you're going into the tube. Maybe you're on a train with a slow network and the JavaScript doesn't load. My friend Stuart Langridge wrote a lot about when you don't have JavaScript. Everyone has JavaScript, right? And here is his flowchart of why you may not. So don't rely upon JavaScript. My friend Matthew Somerville took the UK government's recent coronavirus data site and rejigged it to use less JavaScript. The original one, he said, is a static site fetching and displaying remote data. It's 100% client-side JavaScript React. His version is 238 kilobytes versus 770k. He's removed 550k of JavaScript and it works the same. The charts, etc., are still interactive. So here's the performance of it. Web page tests running side by side. Matthew's version comes in at four seconds. The original, and we're looking for a heading on the bottom, takes about 17 seconds to load over 3G. Interestingly, there's also an about page. Matthew says that's just static text. Surely it's quicker. No, it's worse. Uh, the about page takes a whopping 19 seconds to load, even though it's just text. Using a massive JavaScript library to construct a DOM on the client device is just wasting time and is completely unnecessary. So we need to learn more about HTML. Uh, breaking news, HTML is more than just div and span. It's a rich vocabulary that allows us to write semantic HTML. And that means giving things the right tag. Nothing sophisticated. Here's a demo with a checkbox. We've all written this. Check if you don't want to not to opt out of cancelling or stopping sending you spam forever. Now on the top one, if I click into that label, all I'm doing is selecting the text. To actually check it, I have to have really good aim. On the bottom one, if I click in the label, it fills in the checkbox, which is really great for people with disabilities and maybe really great for you on a bumpy train with a stubby finger trying to hit a small checkbox on a screen. And the difference in the code is that the first one that doesn't work well has an input and a span with that label text. The bottom one that works really well has a, a label as well as an input and that label is associated with the input and therefore clicking on it will select the checkbox. Simple. Here's button. If you use a div of class equals button, you have to remember to set the ARIA role in HTML or JavaScript. You have to remember to manage focusability with the keyboard. And you have to remember to listen to the correct key presses. If you use a button tag, you get all of that for free. We've all seen a website like this. Uh, the way we used to do it in HTML4 was div id equals header, div id equals nav, etc. Because we didn't have a semantic to uh, describe those particular common regions of a page. But the problem with that is, as the spec said, the div element has no special meaning at all. 
authors are strongly encouraged to view the div element as this element of last resort. Use of more appropriate elements instead of div leads to better accessibility for readers and easier maintainability for authors. So HTML5 gives us header, nav, the main tag, article tags, and the footer tag. And as users of assistive technologies such as screen readers can use these to jump around the page and get a mental map. They can use it to jump straight to the main content or they can use it to jump over the nav, for example. This is really useful for screen readers. In Web Aims last screen reader user survey, 25% of your users said they'll use these landmarks wherever they're present. 18% said they use them often, only 13% said they never use them. So use them. Typing NAV between some angle brackets is no more characters and no more difficult to do than typing in DIV. And it just works. You can also add richness with structured data. Now people like me have been saying for ages if you use semantics you're getting better search engine results. Google uh, last year published some information about this. When you add markup to your content, you help search engines understand different components, which can enhance the user experience and get you more traffic. Here's some numbers. Eventbrite saw a 100% increase in year-on-year -year growth of traffic from search. Job Rapido integrated the Google search uh, with their structured data. It's a 115% increase in organic traffic, 270% increase in new user registrations, and a 15% lower bounce rate. Rakuten used the recipe search experience and saw a 2.7 times increase in traffic from search engines and a 1.5 times increase in session duration. Now here's what I do on my blog. I wrap each blog post in an article tag. Um, an article can be used for any discrete item. So a video, a list of videos would have articles. Uh, a list of products would wrap each product in an article, etc. I'm saying that my item type is a blog posting on schema.org, which is a consortium of Google, Yandex, Baidu and Bing. Uh, they have written a vocabulary for almost any kind of content type. Then I'm saying by H2 has an item property of headline. I've got a time element that says when it's published. And I'm giving it various um, various item properties, date created, pub date and date published. And it just works. So when somebody comes to my website with um, an Apple Watch, Safari Reader knows how to format that for that ultra small screen. Enclose main content in an article element and it'll be formatted nicely. Use item prop of title, author, subheading and pub date, for example. You can um, use a figure element with an image and a fig caption to make sure it gets a nice default styling. And form controls, input type equals tail, input type equals date, uh, select, give a really good one-click experience for iWatch users. Now you're asking yourself, Bruce, you're not gorgeous, glamorous or rich. How did you get onto the Apple Watch beta? Well, I didn't. I wrote my markup seven years ago before I even dreamed there would be such a thing as looking at the web on a watch. But because I was using semantic content when Apple decided to format the pages using those semantics, my site just worked. It's also important to notice that accessibility isn't just for people with disabilities. Accessibility is part of usability. High conformance with web accessibility guidelines may provide benefits to users without disabilities. Uh, this was done at a university in Switzerland. 61 people without disabilities use one of three websites differing in levels of accessibility. A high level of web accessibility led to better performance, i.e. task completion time and task completion rate, than low or very low accessibility. High web accessibility improved user ratings, that is perceived usability, aesthetics, workload and trustworthiness, compared to low or very low web accessibility. So these are benefits of making websites that are accessible for disabled people that are felt by people who do not have a disability. 
This is my friend Jamie Knight. He's an autistic web developer for the BBC. And he said something really profound. He said, no one comes to our sites disabled. They come with impairments. We disable them. If you take nothing else from this uh, talk, just remember that where the fluffy bunny of good HTML goes, the Tweety Bird of accessibility follows along. And these two are delicious, by the way. What can you do? Uncle Timbo said, the web is for everyone and collectively we hold the power to change it. It won't be easy, but if we dream a little and work a lot, we can get the web we want. So what can you do? Well, you can learn the semantics of HTML. There's 120-ish elements, that's all. Uh, to give you an idea of what that is, most two-year-old children can say a hundred words in their native languages. By the time your toddler is two and a half, she'll probably know close to 300. All I ask of you is to be better than this baby at speaking HTML. And it was delicious, by the way. You can run automated tests and go for low-hanging fruit. For example, the colour contrast on your websites. In a recent survey of the top million homepages, WebAIM found that 98% have accessibility errors. The most common is low contrast, then missing alternate text, empty links, missing form labels, missing document language and empty buttons. I use this uh, nice contrast widget from Ada Rose Cannon, which goes through my current site, it's a bookmarklet, and marks the areas where I have inadequate contrast. Use HTML and CSS wherever possible, rather than JavaScript. Make sites that work without JavaScript and then enhance them with JavaScript. And choose your libraries carefully. For example, 10 on UI has a React components library, every one of which has been tested with people with disabilities. Therefore, it's Bruce approved. React Bootstrap, on the other hand, has a nav component that doesn't actually use the nav element. It uses div class equals nav. So I don't approve of that one. There are many good component libraries. Uh, the design system of the Australian government is really good for React. RealKit uh, follows YARIA standards, that's so accessibility standards. ReachUI is tested with Safari, VoiceOver, Firefox, etc. If you use Vue, Vue Tensils follows uh, accessibility authoring practices. Tournant UI and Vue accessibility are small and growing. Lion is a white label open source framework agnostic component library from ING Bank, which you can use with any framework or non. And also beware of quicksand. Beware of the quicksand that slows everybody down and sucks them in that is JavaScript. Over time, the amount of JavaScript being sent over the wire has increased to hundreds of K, even on mobile. Alex Russell from Google Chrome said, we cannot continue to use as much JavaScript as is now normal and expect the web to flourish. To get this fixed, we need to confront the developer experience, bait and switch. Tools that cost the poorest users to pay wealthy developers are bunk. Maybe you as a developer can save time by using libraries that require lots of JavaScript to execute on the client, but you are making your users pay. In Germany, to afford 500 megabytes of mobile broadband, it takes one hour of work at average wage. In the US, it takes 5.7 hours. In Nigeria, it takes 22, 28 hours. And in Brazil, it takes 34 hours. In Nigeria, for example, the data needed to watch just two minutes of online video a day can cost more than sending a child to school for a month. I know your auto-playing video is lovely, but I guarantee it's not lovelier than educating a child. There are 7 billion people who are within mobile coverage in the world. 1.1 billion are like us with fast broadband. But by the year 2100, half of the world's population will live in just these 10 countries, only one of which is in what we would call the developed world. Developing countries are home to 94% of the global offline population. The World Bank says making the internet universally accessible and affordable should be a global priority.
Because it's not just about saying lol to your friend's kitten videos. If you live in somewhere where you might be miles to walk for the nearest doctor, a feature phone and the PDF of Where There Is No Doctor, a village healthcare handbook, can be first-line medical advice. There are people who live in countries where children's school textbooks are comparatively very expensive, but a feature phone and access to worldreader.org can give them access to tens of thousands of textbooks for free in their native languages. There are people who live in despotic regimes around the world where having the wrong political opinion, the wrong religion, or loving the wrong person can get you locked up or worse. Access to the web gives them light. As an Egyptian internet activist said, if you want to liberate a country, give them the internet. And if you're tired of my hippie bullshit, here's some numbers. Uh, the McKinsey Global Institute wrote, an increase in internet maturity similar to the one experienced in mature countries over the past five years creates an increase in real gross domestic product per capita of $500 on average during this period. To compare that, it took the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century 50 years to produce the same result. We all make a living on the web and it served us well. We need to pay that forward because the web isn't computers. The web isn't clouds. The web is these African women. The web is this blind guy in Toronto. It's these ladies on a bus I photographed in Bangladesh. It's this lady in a wheelchair in the streets of Taiwan. It's this farmer and his granddaughter I met in Cambodia. It's this man on the New York Metro. It is for everyone. Thanks and elbow bumps.